गुड इवनिंग टू एवरीबडी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ फिलोसी फैमिली आई एक्सटेंड माई वेलकम एंड ग्रीटिंग्स टू ऑल दी व्यूअर्स ऑफ दिस संडे वेबिनार ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ फिलोसी फैमिली आई एक्सटेंड माई वेलकम टू ऑल दी teachers and scholars of philosophy of our country and abroad who are connected with this virtual academic program of philosophy family i can see the faces of many eminent scholars and philosophers of our country i extend my pranam to them today our speaker is professor s ponit silvam today the topic is professor dp chatterjee's anthropological rationalism it will provide us a new dimension in philosophical reflection and you know that professor dp chatterjee is an eminent scholar and philosopher of her country who died last year and who was also the former Union Minister, founder of ICPR, and many philosophical forums, his contribution to philosophy and philosophical organization is noteworthy. And today, Professor Ponil Selvam sir will reflect on his philosophy and philosophical rationalism. Before inviting Professor Ponil Selvam to our family. I would like to reflect some of his academic achievements. Professor Ponit Selvam sir is a stalwart in philosophy of her country, and he was the former head and professor, Department of Philosophy, University of Madras. He was the national fellow ICPR, and he has a lot of contribution for. Indian Philosophical Council (IPC). He has executed many official posts of IPC, and he has tried to popularize philosophy and philosophical research through IPC every year. And it is our pride, privilege, to be associated with him in different philosophical seminars. in our country professor ponit selvam to his credit has many books and many of his philosophical articles have been published in different national and international journals and they have gained a popularity among the scholars of the country and if we think of the field of specialization of professor ponit selvam sir then we can see that he has a specialization in non western philosophy both uh, traditional and contemporary contemporary continental philosophy with a special reference to post modernism philosophy of language cross cultural hermeneutics bioethics religion culture of india and so many things that i don't want to explore you know professor ponir selvam sir is a very popular figure in our country and whenever we organize different national seminar and even seminar we think of him we think of his contribution for the young comers of, our, of that is of philosophy family and professor ponit selvam sir has been associated with the philosophy family and he has contributed some of his best a presentation in philosophy family philosophy family he highly benefited by his talk by his philosophical deliberation and by his wisdom so today we are very happy that he has he has agreed to present a talk in philosophy family today and i also i am also thankful to professor tomas kumar das 
to invite him to fellowship family again and again. We extend our gratitude and we bow down before his, his humble presence in fellowship family. With this, I also extend my gratitude to all the scholars those are present in this webinar and the presence of all of you will definitely strengthen the academic activities of philosophy family. So today with uh, Professor Panit Salbam, I also welcome our admin and host Professor Pramod Kandas and our moderator Dr. K. Omnanra. With this once again, I welcome Professor Panir Salvam sir and request him to present his talk. Over to Panir Salvam sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Maharana ji. Uh, most uh, revered and respected uh, Professor uh, Pramod Kumar Das ji, Professor Om Narayan Das sir, Professor Maharana, and my very close friend, Professor uh, Dilip Kumar Mohantaji. I'm very happy that uh, uh, in spite of his busy uh, works and uh, schedule, academic as well as administrative programs, uh, he could be present here. That is, uh, I consider it as a great privilege to make my presentation in presence of Dilip Ji. And, uh, my good friend, Professor Ranjit uh, Ghoshi and many other friends. At the outset, I am grateful to uh, the philosophy family for uh, making philosophy very active. This means that uh, Pramod Kumar Das and his wonderful team and colleagues have been doing this service to philosophical community by arranging lectures. And I, I have been very much benefited by these lectures and also I had the privilege of uh, delivering a few lectures in the past. So I am grateful to the philosophy family for uh, giving me an opportunity to meet all of you through online. Today, we are going to discuss the anthropological rationalism of uh, Professor D.P. Chattopadhyaya. Uh, he is also known as uh, D.P. in short, and some people call him D.P.C. He is a well-known philosopher of this country, born in the year 1933. He studied at Calcutta University and later at London University School of Economics and Political Science. He studied law, history and philosophy at the University of Calcutta. And also he obtained his uh, DPhil degree from the same university and PhD from London University of School of Economics. He was awarded a Prem Chand Roy Chand scholarship for his work on philosophy of history. He joined uh, the Jadavpur University as a faculty member and later was appointed as a union cabinet minister in May 1971 and later as a governor of Rajasthan. He was also the chairman of uh, uh, ICPR, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, and was also the chairman of the Center for Studies in Civilization, New Delhi. And he passed away last year, that is uh, 2022. His uh, great contribution to philosophy is well known because uh, all of us know that uh, under this FISP, that is uh, philosophy, history, culture, and social science, he has brought out and edited nearly 100 volumes on 
various themes on philosophy, whether it is philosophy, culture, human values, historiography, one can always refer to the great contribution made by the fifth volumes published under CSC, that is Center for Studies in Civilization, New Delhi. And uh, he's a well-known philosopher, not only in India, but also outside, because of his uh, international reputation, because he was well-versed in the philosophy of science, Western philosophy, Indian philosophy, culture, and human values. He has uh, written extensively in the form of books and articles. Some of his publications I would like to quote here. Uh, individuals and Societies, a methodological inquiry published in the year 1967, and later Societies and Cultures, 1973, Individuals and Worlds, Essays in Anthropological Rationalism, published in 1976, then History, Society and Polity, published in 1976, then form, aesthetic experience, and beautiful, and an introduction to aesthetics, written in Bengali in 1981. Environment, evolution, and values, studies in man, society, and science in 1982. Knowledge, freedom, and language, 89. Anthropology and historiography of science in 1990. Then interdisciplinary studies in science, technology, philosophy, and culture, 1995. So as I said just now, under his uh, editorial ship, uh, the FISP, P-H-I-S-P-C, that is philosophy, history, Indian science, and culture, has brought out more than 100 monographs. And this, I would say, is the greatest contribution and also he is uh, mainly responsible for the establishment of uh, ICPR. He was also the chairman of uh, Indian Philosophical Congress, IPC. My discussion on uh, DPC would uh, be on uh, the anthropological rationalism, which uh, he has uh, uh, emphasized in one of his books. This concept is uh, very important uh, because uh, it talks about the social, cultural, and historical setup of human being. While talking about uh, man, Professor D.P. Chattopadhyaya says that human being is multidimensional and uh, fallible and a semiotic being. And further he says, human being moves and lives not merely in space and time, but also in society in which he is an integral part. So DP is of the view that man has a close link with the human society. And also he says, that human life is also a part of uh, history. He himself, uh, that is a uh, human being, is uh, the true author and uh, the creator of uh, the same. And uh, he has a human being, according to him, has a past behind him and a tradition to support and regulate his life. Human being, according to DP, is uh, embedded, or one might even say that he is born in a culture marked by other things like tradition and modernity, language, myth, science, and technology. So according to DP, human being, wherever he goes, or whatever he does, and even if he is a cosmopolite, he always carries his cultural identity and personality with him. And further he says, man as a semiotic human being, semiotic being, is a sign using animal, that is human being as a 
human being is a sign using animal and is a self reflective in nature so you cannot help reflecting on what he is and what he is not so keeping this at the backdrop one can say how human being cannot uh, transcend the challenge of modernization but at the same time human being can question his own tradition and cultural past here i would like to quote uh, uh, dp he says continuous growth of knowledge particularly of its scientific form and advancement of technology often makes us question our own traditional heritage and cultural past and quotes so man according to him always as a tradition to support and to regulate him this means he is sustainable by the present and his culture helps him to go forward dp says man is more a project than a product this is a very important uh, way of uh, analyzing human being in one of his interesting paper rationality culture and values he deals with how there exists an impl implicit relation between rationality and culture and he rejects the claim that uh, there is a unique and universal relation between culture and relativism he believes that culture bound rationality culture bound rationality is a sort of relativism and in fact in this context he talks about three different uh, concepts of rationality developed by three branches of knowledge namely economics evolutionary biology and psychological behaviorism i'll repeat three branches of knowledge are economics evolutionary biology and psychological behaviorism and he says this can be defined uh, in this way that is uh, the three conception of knowledge are known according to him as r e m or capital e capital m r e m which stands for rational economic man and then r e b that is rational evolutionary being and then r o b all capital rationality of behaviorism respectively and he talks about the limitation of the three branches of knowledge because uh, he shows that in these three branches of knowledge the normative aspect of economic man is not taken into account let me very briefly explain this uh, 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 understanding of this uh, three uh, branches of knowledge that is uh, what do we mean by rational economic man uh dp says that human being is something unique in nature and dp is not concerned with uh, the economic man but a rational economic man this is a very important term according to him rational economic man what do you mean by that he says the management head should be not only rational but also moral thus he is talking about rational as well as a moral man so in a cultural life it is the spirit of uh, cooperation which is very much essential this means concepts like love sympathy friendship gratitude which are native to human nature should uh, find a place in economics so he says uh, social welfare of course is very much necessary for sustaining the rationality but at the same time we cannot forget the fact that human being is unique by nature and uh, further he says that no society can allow uh, rich people to become increasingly rich and poor becoming more poor so this means for uh, dp i quote him both the popularization as well as polarization beyond a point need to be arrested 
so this is what he uh, says about uh, the rational economic uh, aspect then we come to the second one the second branch of knowledge that is r e m rational evolutionary uh, r e b that is a uh, rational evolutionary biology wherein he makes a distinction between natural law and social law and uh, he says how evolutionary uh, aspects is very important and he says the biologist no doubt defends the notion of rationality by saying that the rule of the jungle and the laws of the civil society do not differ in essence and dp questions this and raises a doubt whether animals can master the best possible strategy necessary for utility maximization so he is not happy with the second one also then the third one is uh, the behavioristic rationality uh, which has got a psychological orientation and uh, it is enough uh, uh, to understand that this also lacks the normative character of human being so in short we can say that uh, the three branches of knowledge which uh, normally considered as something supreme is not at all acceptable to uh, dp so i would like to keep this as a background because uh, we have to see how he has developed uh, the anthropological rationality in the context of all these three this uh, well known book which i quoted uh, in the beginning itself that is uh, the individuals and worlds that is essays in anthropological rationalism is a very important book uh, uh, because this book has got a, a very significant uh, way of uh, discussing human nature uh, i would say that this uh, approach uh, of dp has got uh, some interesting uh, uh, points first of all this book uh, deals with the idea that uh, whatever results from the human endeavor are subject to human limitation and secondly he says it talks about the idea that the products of uh, human reason and experience are influenced by certain conditions and constraints which are essentially historical in nature so two concepts uh, which are very essential are uh, in the context of anthropological rational, rationality or rationalism or according to dp r two one is uh, the fallibility of man and the second is the growing character of knowledge so the basic problem of the classical rationalism is that it did not take into account the human presupposition of reason and considered it as supreme rational entity similarly the classical empiricism also failed to note down the importance of the growing character of human knowledge and the result is that it had led to skepticism presenting only one dimensional of the individual and the world so dp tries to emphasize that in all types of uh, philosophical discourses there is a presupposition of uh, anthropological rationalism uh, in short one can say in all his writing dp uh, felt that human being should be the center so this this presupposition must be studied carefully otherwise philosophical philosophical implications of it eh, cannot be understood reason of course all of us know plays an important role in the activity of a human being and uh, he says philosophy has suffered i quote him philosophy has suffered enough because of philosophers refusal to learn from others mistakes and to pursue others way of understanding 
and misunderstanding and to see how much we owe to others the fact is that we always depend on others but we we fail to recognize this and others also as infused by our experience and coach so what uh, dp is trying to say by this uh, lengthy quotation is that that the individual is not a fixed and windowless social unit on the other hand he is part and parcel of uh, the society this aspect is something very uh, significant in the writings of dp and also dp argues that uh, man alone knows how to use uh, the language that is the reason why he said uh, man is a sign using animal so he says uh, language which is nothing but the set of signs is always related to some changing rules of uh, the society and further he says that uh, this approach of uh, uh, rationality shows how human being has developed this life through language the language and its importance was very clearly analyzed by dp and he says it is language that we live and we live socially so which means uh, the social aspect of human being is possible only through language it is only through language we try to philosophize of course language is a form of life it is a sense of living and not a mere instrument of living and dp says that many uh, instrumentalists wrongly believe that language is only to convey or communicate our experience in fact uh, he would say that the philosophers of language in general especially in the western context one can say that language is nothing but a mode of communication it is in language we identify the reality both uh, generically and specifically so the identity of the world is in man that is his language so that he tries to show how human being is closely linked with language in fact he says that uh, language always presupposes a society and a society in turn a world so he tries to show how language and society are interrelated the world uh, which we encounter is preconditioned by language and society of course it is very difficult to formulate a universal one universal language and he says that uh, this uh, this uh, presupposition or the assumption to create one language for the entire world is nothing but a dream or a dogma so what is the nature of this world which dp is talking about what is the nature of the world he says the nature of the world is such that it is a real world why is using this word real world because in his view the real world is one which is undivine in nature undivine in nature not only that it is irrational and unpredictable so the real world is human and hence it cannot be one and uniform so this means man is not given with an a priori and a infallible insight into the structure of all possible worlds but uh, the most important fact is that the real world is anthropocentric so here you can see how uh, dp develops the concept of uh, anthropocentric uh, uh, sorry uh, anthro yeah anthropocentric rationalism first of all he says the world in which we participate is a real world it is socially connected world where language operates and here it is not something uh, which is uh, thrusted on us which means we try to develop the real world in the context of a 
anthropocentric understanding. So it is by and in man that the true identity of the world is disclosed. So he is of the view that uh, the defenders of philosophy, for example, in their eagerness to defend it uh, against all possible criticism, convert it into a closed system that is considering the world as a closed system. Because of this, the critical dialogue between man and man, a philosopher, one philosopher and other breaks down. So this means we are, uh, we are, we are, uh, uh, unfortunately, we are unable to understand the real uh, world, which is anthropocentric in nature. And in this context, he analyzes or examines the notion of uh, reason, that is how reason has been playing a very important role <coughs> in the writings of uh, Leibniz and Kant, but at the same time, showing the limitation. And he says uh, that uh, Leibniz's understanding of uh, reason is pre-critical in nature, pre-critical in nature, whereas uh, Kant's uh, understanding of reason is that it is not uh, self-critical. So in this way, uh, DP shows the failure of uh, the Leibnizian model as well as the Kantian model of uh, reason. And moreover, he says the concept of reason, first of all, we have to make clear what do we mean by reason? Because the concept of reason is not free from ambiguity, according to DP. I repeat, the concept of reason is not free from ambiguity because of the reason that the word reason can mean many things. What are they? For example, it may mean an argument or motive or intention or a cause or a premise or justification or an intellectual faculty or function of man, then intellect or intelligence personified, sanity and then sense. So there are different ways of approaching reason because uh, the meaning of uh, the word reason is very ambiguous. But DP, of course, is mainly concerned with uh, two aspects uh, which uh, he has mentioned just now. One is uh, uh, how reason can be a part of intellectual faculty. And secondly, how intellect and intelligence personified can play its role in reason. So this uh, method of understanding uh, uh, Leibniz as well as Kant has given him some new way of understanding the rationality. So his uh, major objection uh, to Leibniz is that it is pre-critical. And uh, secondly, Kantian model is that uh, it is not uh, self-critical. Of course, I'm not uh, going to explain this. And if necessary, we shall discuss this in the, uh, uh, during our discussion time. Now, what do, how do we explain the nature of uh, anthropological rationalism? Uh, by pointing out uh, the defects of both uh, Leibniz as well as Kant, by saying Kant failed to develop the theory of uh, self-critical uh, reason, which is partly due to his uh, uncritical adherence to uh, to the uh, notion of uh, uh, notion that the empirical is formless. Uh, now, uh, DP develops uh, a theory of man, which is uh, nothing but. Uh, they are, which is anthropological in character. Uh, this approach uh, is something very much essential for uh, placing man in the human society. DP argues that uh, reason must be primarily studied in the anthropological context. So I, I, I would like to say here that there are different ways of understanding reason or rationality. And uh, we have the approach made by the classical approach as well as we can say a traditional approach and also modern understanding of reason, uh, which is very much available in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in a modern period, especially in uh, rationalism, etc. But uh, this approach uh, uh, does not satisfy DP 
So he wants to develop a new methodology for understanding reason. And uh, his uh, method of understanding reason is something unique because he argues that the reason is always anthropological in character. So keeping reason at the, at the, at the center of uh, uh, anthropological context is uh, something very, very important for DP. Though here I, I, I should say that though uh, DP does not uh, deny the role of a practical reason, uh, he firmly believes that uh, the discussion on reason or the structure of reason or the function of reason, since it is very abstract, that cannot be very helpful to human society. So how to understand reason, he says, I quote him, reason is, in quote, primarily, right, <coughs> reason primarily is anthropological and historical concept. And this means uh, the, the self-critical character of reason and phenomenological reflection on the structure and functions of reason show that it is fallible and human origin. So man as an agent of uh, uh, his own critical thought has to be analyzed both uh, theoretically and practically. So this is something novel, I would say, in the history of uh, philosophical discourse, because uh, though we have been uh, developing a concept of reason from the Greek period onwards, uh, DP has given uh, a new methodology for understanding reason because he keeps a human being at the center. Now, let us say how he developed this concept. Now, reason, according to him, is human. It is the most influential human capacity of synthesis and analysis. In fact, uh, synthesis always, according to him, synthesis always presupposes uh, analysis and the distinction between analysis and synthesis breaks down when we take into the anthropological uh, rationalism. This is uh, another contribution of uh, uh, DP in the context of uh, the anthropological uh, 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 reason. So reason always, according to him, is uh, uh, human in nature. And the capacity of a human being, of course, is always limited. The humanity, uh, I mean, human being has a limited capacity. But the limit is set by the world in which we live and by the individuals with whom we move. Here, yeah, DP says, I quote him, what sets limit to my thought, right? What sets my limit to my thought and action also enables me to identify myself and to change my identity in history without destroying its recognizability or re-identifiability. This is uh, something which, uh, by which uh, is trying to show that there is a limit to human freedom, right? He argues that human beings uh, can be understood through consciousness. But the consciousness here, he, he develops a new way of understanding consciousness. He says uh, the consciousness is connected to the objective world or the object world of, of object hyphen world. That is, it is limited by objects and unable to get its uh, own zero point. So in this way, uh, DP is trying to show a synthetic, as I mean, empirical synthesis, I would like to call it empirical synthesis of uh, uh, rationality by relating our reason, your human reason, with worldly experience. So here he talks about uh, the world and the man relation. Is, uh, he says it is a puzzling problem, how the human being is related to the society or the world is always a puzzling problem. Though this uh, problem has been discussed in detail, a satisfactory solution is uh, yet to arrive according to him. So what is important to DP is how human being or a man 
is related to the world. So he tries to give uh, a rational explanation to the question and from it he tries to develop the anthropological rationalism. So though normally we talk about uh, the world and uh, the human being relation or say the world and man relation, one can also think of a manless world. This is a very beautiful concept he has developed. Manless world. Uh, how do we formulate the idea of a manless world? He says uh, the manless uh, world can be formulated in the possible, uh, the following possible ways. One is, for example, one can think of a, a world in which uh, man has not made his appearance yet. And secondly, B, that is a world where from man has disappeared. C, a world in which man exists, but its existence is ignored. So these are three possible ways of uh, understanding the world human relation or manless world. And uh, DP here talks about uh, the distinction between philosophy and science. And he says that scientific concepts uh, or re sorry, less reflective than the philosophical ones. And uh, so philosoph uh, philosophical approach gives a new dimension to the man uh, and uh, uh, world relation. Uh, one minute. And further, he analyzes this uh, concept of uh, a uh, manless world. How can we, we conceive the idea of a manless world? And he says, the manless world has more than one interpretation. In one sense, uh, we can always defend the possibility of uh, a manless world. And in another sense, we can also deny the very possibility of such a world. So these are nothing but the scientific and the philosophical conception of the world. For DP, the philosophical conception of the world is deeper. And he says uh, it is the pre-naturalist view of the world, which is generally accepted by the scientists. But a close observation of this view would reveal the fact that it conceals the anti-naturalistic views. Though man is in nature, his being is never completely merged or absorbed in it. He has the ability to go beyond it. So man is uh, neither completely absorbed in the world, nor is he completely free from it. In other words, his relation with the world is marked by an existential dialectic. In one aspect of this dialectic, man's being defines the world in nature and in another dialectic uh, the world defines his being now you can see the manless world how this could be interpreted in two different ways so when we say that the world is uh, in so far as it is in man it does not mean to support uh, that the notion of essayist philosophy which the emphasis hold. This is a view of uh, DP. Perhaps one can call it uh, the anthropological solipsism, he says. This is not uh, what he would like to support. He does not believe that man's existence, however important it might be in the world, can define the structures and the process of the world. The world we live in includes our existence as its essential and it is uh, humanly impossible for us to think of the world in which uh, man is not there. So this means a manless world cannot be thought of. This means the man without uh, ceasing to be what he is, uh, what he is cannot think of a manless world. So this approach uh, is different from the other idealistic approach as well as the realistic approach. His approach, otherwise known as anthropological approach, is more descriptive and less interpretive than the two types of uh, the traditional approaches. 
Now let us see how DP analyzes this further. The world, according to him, is both within and without man. I'll repeat, the world, according to him, is within and without man. It is both dependent and independent of man. One can easily say that there is a world without man, which means the world is independent of man. This is obvious. What is not so obvious is that the world is also within man. That is, the world is dependent on man. The world is within and without man. Independent existence of the world without man is very well accepted and known. So the manless world is an abstraction from or an extrapolation of the man world. So it is a real description of uh, the uh, human being and the world. So he's talking about all the time, he's trying to emphasize the notion that uh, we cannot think of uh, a manless world. So it is a world in which man, human beings live. So this approach uh, is very much essential for us to uh, understand the social dimension of man. So there are different, according to him, there are different ways of understanding human activity. Sometimes man is concerned with uh, what he calls the object-oriented consciousness. And in another, he is uh, concerned with the subject-oriented consciousness. So there is a distinction between object-oriented consciousness and subject-oriented consciousness. In the first, uh, he may be concerned with the knowledge, action, imagination, appreciation, etc. In the second one, that is in the, in the subject-oriented consciousness, he may be concerned with uh, artistic, philosophical and moral, where human being is involved in his own subjectivity. In this uh, subject-oriented consciousness, the objectivity is there. Here, DP makes a distinction by saying that science deals with object-oriented consciousness and ethics is concerned with the, the subject-oriented consciousness. So the pure, the pure subjectivist understanding and the pure objects are engaging in a common pursuit. So this uh, methodology gives us a new way of understanding. When I think of this object-oriented consciousness and subject-oriented consciousness, I was trying to relate it with the phenomenology by saying that how in the empirical perspective there is always an object-oriented consciousness. And uh, when we talk about the self, for example, especially in Indian context, we are concerned about the subject-oriented consciousness. Of course, this is one, one, one interpretation which I would like to give with regard to this, but uh, I don't know whether DP would accept this, but uh, I have uh, my own reason for saying this. If necessary, we'll, we'll argue this, uh, we'll, we'll develop this in, the, in our uh, discussion time. So, DP is of the view that uh, some philosophers have been very much uh, attracted by the method of physical science because uh, of its uh, testability and precision, precision criteria, for example. Some others accept the methodology or the model of analogy of God, where it is said that God has got uh, uh, the ultimate power. But the DP feels that in all philosophical positions, there is an inarticulate, this is very important, inarticulate anthropological presupposition. So since philosophy is a reflective inquiry, every philosopher consciously or unconsciously touches uh, the principle of uh, anthropological root. Uh, I, uh, DP, uh, criticized, corrected, and corroborated by the objective details of experience, the philosopher broadens and deepens his theological, uh, sorry, his theoretical visions, unquote. It is because knowledge cannot grow in vacuum, right? Uh, growth 
always demands the objective co uh, correlate. So a person, according to DP, is not uh, a pure consciousness. This is another, uh, when, I, when, I, when I read this passage, my mind was trying to connect it with, uh, with uh, uh, the pure consciousness with uh, some of the uh, Indian philosophical schools are talking about. Uh, now, DP argues that uh, a person is not uh, a pure consciousness. In fact, uh, for me, there is nothing called pure consciousness. It, it, can, be, it can be questioned. Uh, the nature of pure consciousness can be questioned. Uh, because uh, it, it is, I feel it is something abstract. Now, DP has another mode of understanding this. Uh, he says that a human being or a person <coughs> is not a uh, pure consciousness. Person, according to him, is opaque and his uh, opacity is due to his uh, embodiment and the worldly nature. In one sense, it means that he is in the world. At the same time, he is not in the world. His being is prayer to being in the world and does not consist in its being perceived. It is only in the world that he can be conscious of his uh, property. That is, uh, he can be aware of uh, his existential uh, nature when he participates in the world. His freedom, no doubt, is limited and the limit which is always changing is set by his body and his world. So man, according to DP, is born first in nature and then in society. His second birth, namely society, according to DP, makes him painfully aware of his uh, inherent paradox and also of the power to solve the paradox. Since man is not uh, with the world given to him, he is bent upon making his own, own world. He separated himself from nature and he originally belongs, which he originally belongs to. Man becomes conscious of his uh, creative freedom. But uh, in his uh, bid to be fully free, he cannot and uh, should not uh, try to cut his original relation with nature. So, man, uh, I mean, according to DP, man has a uh, two aspects of uh, uh, being in him, that is, he is both uh, himself uh, and, uh, and for other selves. This approach uh, of uh, DP is something remarkable in the context of social philosophy also. And uh, he would go to the extent of saying that human being is always partly erased and partly exposed. He cannot either erase himself fully out of the other selves or identify himself completely with the uh, later because uh, he is exposed to the world. Here, when I read this passage, I was very much uh, 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 influenced uh, because of the main reason that I could see some similarities between this approach of uh, uh, um, DP with, uh, with uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas understanding of the other, where you know, the individual exists when the other exists. So DP is also emphasizing the significance of uh, the other uh, because uh, he talks about himself and the other selves. He talks about man as I, that is I, and the other self, the existence of the other. So, for him, I would say that uh, the existence of the world is possible uh, because of, of uh, me, that is I, and the other. So here I see the parallel between uh, uh, DP and uh, uh, Levinas. Now, uh, I come to the uh, last part, namely how DP's uh, anthropological rationalism can be understood in the context of uh, modern philosophical discourse. Now, when I read uh, his interesting uh, uh, approach uh, to tradition, because he was also one who was talking about the tradition, I, my, immediate, my mind immediately connected uh, his notion of tradition with that of uh, uh, Gadamer, who 
or also talks about tradition and culture because dp who is also concerned about tradition and uh, tradition and culture has developed a new method of understanding tradition uh, dp has not i feel that's my uh, it's not criticism because uh, i don't think that i have the competence to criticize such a great man but this uh, my understanding uh, actually uh, uh, is uh, is is to uh, is to show another uh, dimension which uh, perhaps he has not uh, taken into account sir you have muted sir you have muted yourself anil salam sir okay yes. and now all right uh, okay ah uh, okay and now <coughs> what is that where i was yeah yeah uh, what i was trying to say is i don't know whether you got this point um, because you said i was muted uh, i was trying to look at uh, the philosophical discourse of anthropological rationalism of uh, dp in the context of uh, modern philosophy uh, modern philosophy is in the in the, in the hermeneutic as well as uh, the post modern tradition where do we locate him because this is very much essential for us to see uh, in the at the present juncture where do we uh, put our own thinkers because uh, i always feel that uh, dp's approach uh, of course has got uh, very beautiful insights but let us see uh, whether uh, his method uh, can really serve the purpose uh, as i said just now i don't know whether you heard this statement because uh, you said i was muted that uh, i i don't think that i have the competence to uh, make a criticism against his views but uh, what i would like to say is there is another way of looking at his uh, uh, approach uh, and this is from uh, uh, from the hermeneutical tradition so let us see whether whether uh, uh, he he would uh, support this uh, methodology now what is that i feel that dp has not fully taken into account the role of uh, tradition and culture uh, because uh, he talks about uh, uh, the significance of tradition no doubt but uh, if you read uh, gadamer gadamerian understanding of uh, uh, tradition is something different because uh, gadamer is of the view that uh, uh, tradition is that which connects the past present and future and there is a inevitable and uh, inescapable uh, relation that exists between tradition and uh, heritage and this uh, uh, that is the reason why uh, gadamer says that is inescapable practicity so this uh, approach of tradition uh, helps us uh, to know our our rootedness which means uh, tradition according to gadamer is a primordial uh, ontological condition which helps us to know our existence so but uh, in 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 uh, dp's approach i feel that uh, this uh, method is uh, or this approach is uh, very i mean he is not uh, what should i say he has not taken into account the uh, significance of the tradition fully uh, gadamer for gadamer tradition is always right because it is always traditional that is that is a one beautiful statement which uh, gadamer makes but uh, uh, but at the same time we should also understand the fact that uh, get, uh, simply uh, the dp will not uh, support tradition he is a one who questions the tradition though he says uh, though we are we are placed in the tradition we always question the tradition because we know how to question the tradition because we are all rational being and uh, when i read this passage uh, i was reminded of uh, uh, habermas who also and of uh, paul ricker and others who also challenges uh, the role of uh, tradition because uh, habermas for example he emphasizes uh, the need to break from the belongingness of the tradition uh, whether one can uh, detach himself from the tradition uh, is a question but uh, 
And now we can apply the criticism to uh, um, DP also because DP questions the tradition. So the problem, but the problem is whether one can completely detach oneself from that of the tradition is something which uh, which uh, uh, we have to examine further. Then uh, DP, uh, while well, talking about DP, I said that he's the one who talked about uh, the close link that exists between rationality and culture. And he rejects the view that there is a universal relation between these two. In the, in the beginning of my talk, I, I made a, a reference to his, one of his uh, article, wherein he talks about the uh, a close link that exists between uh, 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 rationality and culture. Now, I would like to examine these two concepts further to present a philosophical theory of culture and rationality. We always find different conception of culture, right? The culture of people uh, takes into account the language, the ideas, customs, taboos, and other related concepts. So one must uh, always <coughs> consider the following aspects when we, uh, when we uh, talk about culture. What is that? We have to remember the fact it is the culture which unifies men into one cultural group and the development of uh, many culture due to various external factors must also uh, we have to take into account. Uh, then only uh, we can truly understand uh, the significance of a uh, culture. This uh, approach of culture, I feel, uh, has not been perhaps uh, developed fully by 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 uh, uh, DP. And uh, one, of course, one can really appreciate uh, DP for including morality in economics. This is a very beautiful uh, concept which he has developed. Uh, he says uh, that the most of, that most of the time, the economic man is not rational. This is what he has emphasized. So the significant aspect of uh, the economic man is that uh, he should uh, take into account the human element and this is something very much to uh, be uh, appreciated in uh, DP's writing. And another important contribution of DP is uh, in his uh, relation between the ethical and uh, uh, economic values. And he says that uh, the economic man should also be ethical. This is also something uh, very uh, significant in his writing. And another significant aspect of anthropological realism, rationalism is that the role of human experience is very, very much stressed. This is, this is uh, what uh, I would say is the greatest contribution of uh, DP. Why I am attracted toward this uh, uh, anthropological rationalism? Of course, many of us talk about rationalism from the, as I said in the beginning, from uh, Greek period on, onwards, philosophers have been talking about rationality. Here, there is a new methodology which uh, DP has given because of the main reason that uh, human experience uh, is a center. Human experience plays a very important role in understanding the anthropological rationalism. It is not uh, because, for example, Habermas also talks about uh, uh, the communicative rationality. But here in DP, it is not a communicative rationality. It is, uh, it is anthropological rationality. So which means the human experience is very much uh, uh, stressed. And similarly, the growing character of uh, knowledge is discussed very much by him to show the value of it. So he rejects uh, the classical uh, as well as uh, the uh, traditional way of understanding uh, uh, rationality by showing that there is a new methodology which uh, one has to practice. And then finally, I would like to see uh, how uh, DP has examined both uh, philosophy and uh, science because uh, he was uh, uh, critical about science. Of course, there are many philosophers uh, uh, and uh, contemporary thinkers who have uh, made an attempt to uh, show the distinction between philosophy and science and argued that uh, science uh, uh, lacks uh, the human face and all that one. Uh, so in this context, it is very much uh, essential for us to uh, understand that distinction which uh, DP makes. DP makes uh, a distinction between philosophy and science and argue that philosophy is more uh, complete than science. Hope you remember uh, the words of uh, DP. 
when I was, uh, uh, I mean, talking about uh, uh, the distinction between philosophy and science, he says that uh, philosophy is more complete uh, than science. Of course, uh, he offers his own argument uh, to support uh, the above claim. But uh, look at uh, two uh, eminent philosophers of our contemporary period and uh, how they approach uh, philosophy and science. Uh, what is that? Who are they? The two great, great thinkers uh, are uh, one is uh, Husserl, Edmund Husserl, and the other is uh, uh, R. Sundarajan. Now, Husserl, in his well known book, uh, The Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology, and Sundarajan, uh, in his well known book, uh, Beyond uh, the Crisis of, uh, sorry, Beyond the Crisis of European Sciences Towards a New Beginning. Both these books deal with uh, the above uh, distinction, that is namely uh, between philosophy and science, uh, which uh, DP has uh, uh, dealt with. Now, these two thinkers of our contemporary period explain the need to develop a conceptual framework for understanding science and also to support the relation between science and philosophy. See, philosophy, by making a demarcation between philosophy and science and by saying that philosophy is more complete than science, I feel that DP has uh, uh, missed one important uh, uh, salient features of uh, the interrelation that exists between philosophy and science. Uh, I give one example and then I, I would like to uh, close. Uh, Sundarajan, for example, wanted to develop a uh, a four-fold framework of science. In this four-fold framework of, see, my, my idea here is that while talking about the relation that exists between philosophy and science, uh, DP argues that one is incomplete uh, whereas other is complete. That is, science is incomplete whereas philosophy is complete. Now, uh, Sundarajan gives a different framework of understanding the relation that exists between uh, philosophy and science. Of course, philosophy, science has got uh, uh, some limitation uh, because once we believe that, uh, once we believe that science can solve all problems, but later we realize it cannot solve the problems. In fact, Kierkegaard gives a very beautiful example. That is, uh, Kierkegaard says uh, in a village, uh, people were, all people in a village were affected by a particular eye disease, right? Uh, so they don't know how to cure this disease uh, because each and every individual in the village has been affected by this. So then somebody from the other village uh, comes to this place and then tells that uh, the next village there is uh, a old man who can uh, cure all of you. So you please go to him uh, so that he can cure all of you. So all these people vacated uh, their village and go to that uh, old man you know, who lives in the next village. And to their surprise, they found that the old man was also affected by the same disease. Now, by giving this uh, analogy or this uh, uh, example, Kierkegaard argues that uh, science cannot solve all the problems. But Sundarajan uses this uh, uh, example given by Kierkegaard in order to show that once we believe that science can all pro solve all problems, but it is not. So we later we found out that science has got some uh, basic problem. So Sundarajan develops a new four-fold framework of uh, science. That is science as a possibility, science as a fact, science as a problem, and science as hope. And he says that uh, by analyzing this four-fold way of understanding science, science one can understand that science can be helped by uh, philosophy. Otherwise, science as a possibility, for example, philosophy is a facilitative. And the critical approach of philosophy is helpful to science. And similarly, in the second, science as a fact, there is a radical change in the relation between philosophy and science. Philosophy has to help science by analyzing the social reality. Analysis and the clarificatory procedures of philosophy are immensely helpful in understanding the basic principles and methods of science. And in the third one, that is science as a problem, adopts a critical function to philosophy. Here, 
philosophy takes the possibility of a critique of science in terms of a normative understanding of life. The crisis of sciences is approached by philosophy to solve it. For example, the role, the role of science in, uh, in, in the politics of domination, colonization has been questioned and here philosophy comes to the rescue. And finally, in the fourth fold of science, it is said that science has a hope. That is, we allow new possibilities taking into consideration its failures and limitations. This means that one needs a new self-understanding, which is only possible through the study of uh, both science and philosophy simultaneously. So this is my uh, uh, approach uh, towards uh, uh, DP's understanding of uh, the relation that exists between philosophy and science. So the interaction between the scientists and philosophers alone can solve many problems. And uh, I don't know how far the method which is adopted by DP say by saying that philosophy is complete, whereas uh, science is incomplete, can solve many of the uh, existing uh, 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 existential problems, in fact. So this uh, methodology, I would like to conclude here that the methodology which uh, he has adopted is something uh, uh, novel because the anthropological rationalism has got uh, uh, two beautiful uh, uh, points. One is uh, it, uh, it it goes around the man. That is, it is the center uh, in the world. The human being is a center. So this approach uh, talks about uh, the significance of human being in a society. And it is very difficult for us to think of uh, uh, a world without human beings. So manless world is an impossibility. So I feel that uh, DP has given a new way of understanding rationality by uh, keeping it uh, in, 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 the, in the context of uh, 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 society. This means the rationality is something which is social. So this uh, method, I would say, is something novel in the contemporary uh, philosophical discourse. So that is the reason why uh, I think we have to celebrate uh, 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 DP. And not only that, my idea of taking this uh, uh, approach, uh, taking DP, uh, has got another reason. What is that? See, it is very uh, essential for us to talk about, right, uh, our own thinkers in Indian context, especially, of course, from the classical period up to the present in Indian tradition, we have got, we have a very great uh, thinkers. But uh, what is significant is the recent uh, philosophical discourse in India is something which is unique. Uh, uh, that has to be celebrated because we have great uh, uh, history of uh, uh, philosophers in India. No, take uh, whether it is Dayakrishna or Rajan Prasad or Sundar Rajan or DP. All these great thinkers have contributed substantially by approaching the reality from their own uh, perspective. R Ramu Gandhi also, Ramchandra Gandhi, and many others. So all these thinkers have given a new dimension to and uh, dimension for understanding philosophical problems. That is one of the main reasons why I thought I should uh, uh, discuss uh, or I introduce this concept for mainly for uh, uh, my students because uh, some of them may not uh, uh, be aware of the name D.P. Chattopadhyaya, and he's the greatest philosopher who philosopher who has contributed substantially for the progress of philosophy. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, um, the organizers for giving me the nice opportunity of uh, sharing my view. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks uh, so much, sir, for your very thought-provoking presentation on Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay's concept on anthropological rationalism. It is uh, too much illuminating and, and technical also, sir, your deep understanding and the philosophical reflection of Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay has benefited all of us. And uh, uh, in your uh, 
uh, you have made a very conceptual analysis on BP's view on man in uh, relation to the limit of origin, cultural identity, use of uh, language, uh, society, uh, man manless world, uh, ethical and economic value, uh, and, uh, and, and on uh, different aspects. Uh, um, it's very much reflected in the era of postmodernism. And by taking, uh, uh, we have taken, uh, you have taken so, so many philosophers um, uh, in connectivity with uh, Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay. And by taking Sundarajan's stand on the science and uh, philosophy, you have, uh, you have very clearly analyzed that uh, how scientific concepts are less reflective than philosophical uh, concepts. And by putting man at center, you talked of three construction of knowledge that is uh, uh, a rational economic man, a rational um, evolutionary man, a rational behavioral man, and so many things. And today you have also justified how man is self reflected self-creative. And your entire discussion is very much uh, technical and has strengthened and strengthened our uh, deep uh, um, the dimension of thought. And it has also benefited all of us. Thanks so much, sir. Now, I would like to request Professor Dr. K. Omnan Rao to carry on the interactive session. Over to Dr. Rao. Namaskar, everybody. Um, thank you so much, sir, for uh, this beautiful lecture. Well, you have brought in um, Professor D.P. Chuttapadhyay for a great discussion uh, in philosophy family. Well, you do a lot of service to philosophy in Taking the Indian thinkers, you talk of uh, the other day you were talking on uh, Ganeshwar Mishra sir and now uh, D.P. Chattopadhyay and you are also thinking of Professor Rajendra Prashad and also and Daya Krishna too. So, so, so the 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 thing, the culture, the tradition that we carry uh, uh, in India that they have to be popularized and that is a great attempt on your part. And today we are really um, benefited by your talk. Uh, at first, I would like to uh, request um, um, Dr. Uh, Amita Valmiki, madam, because she raised a question in the chat box. Well, uh, if she uh, personally um, talks to Professor Panir Selvam, sir, it, it would be much more better, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Valmiki, madam, do you want to um, directly raise the question? Well, what um, 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 Dr. Valmiki wanted to assert that. Hello, uh, hello. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Madam, Namaskar. Carry on, ma'am. Namaste, yes. Namaste, sir. Um, it is such a pleasure, you know, to always listening. Uh, Panir Selvam, sir. It's uh, my honor, pleasure. Whatever you say, it is always great feeling to listen Thank to you. him. He's a living encyclopedia, sir. Thank <laughs> you for being there. <laughs> and. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, was Gramsci, Gramsci uh, and uh, even, um, um, of course, along with um, uh, Habermas and uh, many others, were they influenced? Uh, 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 I mean, uh, D.P. Chattopadhyay was influenced by all of these people at the same time because he seems to be in simultaneity. Uh, somewhere I was also reminded uh, of uh, Donald Davidson's uh, anomalous monism that um, Though it is uh, physical in nature, a uh, mind, but you can't reduce to physicality. Uh, so, uh, are all these coming together in him? And uh, he's therefore very distinct because even you can see Habermas uh, and Sundar Rajan when you read uh, Sundar Rajan uh, contrasting, especially Habermas subversion. So if you think from critical thinking uh, uh, theory, uh, uh, critical theories of Habermas and uh, you uh, when you uh, understand uh, concept of Purushartha for example uh, he talks same like uh, uh, D.P. Chattopadhyay and at the same time uh, Sundarajan contradicts that but even that is seen in Chattopadhyay so I was wondering uh, was he the amalgamation of Gramsci and uh, uh, Kierkegaard and Buber was there you know, going above uh, the di monologue, go to dialogue, and even Gabriel Marcel was being reflected so much, I felt. So was that whole gamut of these philosophers influencing him? This was my question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Amidaji. 
Thank I'm happy you. that uh, that uh, you could uh, be here, and I'm very grateful to you. I'm uh, very grateful to you for your wonderful questions. Uh, oh, I I feel that uh, DP, as you rightly said, is an amalgamation of uh, different traditions. Mm, in fact, uh, I would say that uh, his approach to uh, philosophy. Uh, is something uh, really different from that of others uh, for the main reason that uh, in his writings we could see the synthesis of uh, uh, sociology uh, philosophy of science and other anthropology and all other disciplines because he is a versatile scholar and he was very much thorough with uh, the different traditions of the west and you are right uh, that uh, I once I talked to him, of course, I, I was uh, in a very close association with him. And once I talked to him about uh, the influence of uh, Habermas on him. And uh, he told me that uh, Habermas's uh, critical thinking had a tremendous impact on his uh, writing. Uh, in fact, I am trying to uh, call out how this uh, could be seen in his writing. In fact, uh, uh, when you when you when you read uh, the uh, editorial notes uh, on <coughs> on uh, the different volumes which he has edited, because you know nearly as I said in the beginning, nearly hundred volumes have come out. In all these volumes, he being the editor <coughs> used to write a lengthy uh, foreword or editorial note, uh, wherein you can see how he is trying to relate. Uh, this philosophical discourse with uh, many of the Western thinkers, at the same time showing uh, the approach of Indian philosophers also. So I always feel that uh, his approach towards uh, philosophical discourse was very much uh, influenced by the uh, West, especially this is my uh, first uh, argument, that he was more influenced perhaps, I would say was influenced by the Western tradition. Because you know, uh, uh, he was a, a student of a pauper, I, I think. So from that time onwards, uh, he has a leaning towards uh, uh, Western philosophical discourse. And also, all of us know that he's a well-known uh, phenomenological uh, master, I would say, because he's the one who was very beautifully edited uh, phenomenology and Indian philosophy with uh, Embry and others. That uh, very clearly shows that he is not only well versed in uh, Western tradition, but also in Indian tradition. So I would say he is uh, uh, the amalgamation or synthesis of a different tradition. As you very correctly said, you can see uh, the Martin Buber's uh, approach and the Gramsci, uh, Gadamer, and all. Davidson also, you are right, because you know, when he was in Jadapur, he was more influenced by analytical philosophy. Later, I would say he was also talking about uh, the, uh, the continental philosophical discourse. So uh, some of us uh, make a divide between these two. I don't know whether he had this uh, division between analytical and continental, but I would say that he equally appreciated both the traditions. So in this way, I would say uh, that his approach is something remarkable. And in fact, I would say, I would, I would go to the extent of saying, if I am allowed to say, that uh, I, I am unable to see a, an equal thinker like DP in Indian context. Uh, I, I may be over exaggerating, I don't know, but uh, maybe it is because of my uh, close Absolutely, association. Sir. Absolutely. Uh, so, this is what uh, I would like to say. And you are right, uh, Professor Midaji, uh, uh, that. Uh, and uh, one more thing, that he was so closely associated with, uh, uh, with Sundar Rajan. They were very close friends. Eh? So Sundarajan used to say that it is uh, DP who has shaped many of his thoughts. Uh, that is possible because especially uh, Sundarajan's uh, uh, book, last book, I would say, that, uh, that, uh, which was published by Chimla Institute, he talks about the phenomenological approach wherein the synthesis between the individual as well as society, how they are important and all. This book uh, was very, very much appreciated by uh, DP. So this, uh, I mean, they're all, I would say, the phenomenological masters of India who could uh, you know, influence uh, all of us. This is what I would like to say. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Amita Valmiki, Madam, and also the beautiful response by Professor Panil Selvam. Sir, let, let's move to uh, Professor uh, Dilip Kumar Mahanta, sir. Well, he wants to raise a question. Okay. Welcome, sir. Please. Professor Mahanta. Sir, your voice is not coming, sir. Sir, your voice is not coming, Professor Mahanta. Yes, sir. Now you speak, sir. Now you speak, maybe. Uh, yes. Am I audible now? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, <clears throat> first of all, I congratulate Professor Ponido Salvam for his wonderful talk. I consider him to be a very efficient academic cook. He can... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> this is the only metaphor I can use for him but uh, in fact I have no question on two queries okay. that <clears throat> one is uh, regarding uh, the you are uh, speaking about uh, the new approach in uh, anthropological rationalism by GP and Sometimes you are speaking about manless world, a possible world. Uh, but I, 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 what I feel difficulty that a manless world not exist, uh, concerned or the existence of man. It may be ambiguous. Uh, it may be ambiguous. Can 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 it make a sense? from C. Aurobindo's concept of evolutionary man, because we know the philosophy of C. Aurobindo has the greatest influence on G.P. Chattopadhyay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did his PhD 1955 to 58. The title was History, Society and Polity, Integral Sociology of Sri Aurobindo. And later on also, Marx and C. Aurobindo, one is called dialectical sociology, other is called integral sociology. I think unless we introduce the concept of evolutionary man, okay. otherwise these presentations of the manless world may lead us to many ambiguous things. Okay. So this is one uh, comment. Secondly, my query is that uh, uh, Professor Ponira Silbam has said that DP has introduced new methodology. It is also, and very often you are speaking about society. He is concerned about polity. He himself practically was engaged in politics. And he said he, when he was compiling these individuals and words, from where Professor Ponira Silbam has referred some of the articles that during his uh, these those uh, days of being a political animal he uh, he said dp so don't you think that this there is a controversy you also introduced uh, the views of sundar rajan the methodology of social sciences and methodology of natural sciences are they totally different according to devi the dp or they are complementary. So what do you think? Because uh, he has worked on also methodology. Uh, I have not read this, but since you introduced this, I, I, I seek uh, this clarification. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, my dear uh, good friend, uh, Professor Diliji. Uh, I always consider Dilip Ji as uh, my academic guru for the main reason that uh, he is well versed uh, both in Indian tradition as well as Western tradition. And it is always uh, a pleasure to listen to his observations. And I always take his observations very seriously. Now, two queries he has uh, raised. One is uh, this uh, manless world. This is a very, very important concept, no doubt, in uh, DP. And I feel that when DP talks about the manless world, 
uh, he is talking about the concept of man who is uh, neither completely absorbed into the world nor is completely free from the world what does this mean this means that uh, one cannot uh, conceive i mean this is how i understood one cannot conceive the idea of uh, the world uh, in which uh, man is absent uh, very very beautifully you have, you have quoted uh, uh, c arabindo i was also <coughs> thinking about that how in the it is a, it is something in the process of evolution something when you say for example i, I just uh, I, i would like to quote uh, his quotation he says man is not a, a, a product right so this uh, is uh, something which which can be uh, compared to that of the evolutionary concept of a human being in sri arabindo because it is in the process so this is not the human being is not the end product so this uh, approach of uh, dp i would say is uh, very much uh, essential uh, when he talks about a manless world he, when he says that we cannot think of a manless world it means human being is who is very much essential for part and parcel of the world so i would uh, uh, like to um, answer your first question in this way but i don't know for i am right and secondly a new methodology why dp has to be studied dp's uh, methodology of course he has given very many novel concepts one concept is this anthropological rationalism because the classical approach which is uh, very much present uh, as i said in my talk from the beginning this is uh, anthropology keeping human being as the center he is a one dp is one who talks about uh, the social reality social values are important human being as a social animal is important so this uh, i would say uh, is something uh, uh, different from that of uh, the other thinkers because most of the time we are talking about a metaphysical man but here i feel that he is talking about a social man and here i would like to say that uh, uh, swami vivekananda comes uh, 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 very close to uh, dp so the social uh, aspect of man has been emphasized to by uh, dp that, that is uh, the new methodology uh, i would say uh, uh, which has emerged from the writings of uh, This is what I would like to say, sir. Thank you. Well, let's 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 welcome Professor Ranjit Ghosh, sir. Before we go uh, to the question in the chat box, well, let us welcome Professor Ghosh uh, for his observations and uh, queries. Professor Ghosh, Namaskar, sir. Please. Sir, please unmute, sir. Sir, please unmute, sir. Yes. Thank you. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. yeah. Uh, we must thank Professor Panisilvam for his encyclopedic exposition. That is what I say always. He uh, brings many factors into it. Yeah. But uh, this anthropological rationalism, I would like to conclude in one sentence by saying that, like uh, Sart, that as Sart said, man is condemned to be free. I would like to say that man is condemned to experience yeah. tension. between relativism and rationality this is the fact now coming to uh, professor dp i would uh, like to say that uh, dp in dp's exposition he has very nicely uh, given us uh, the exposition of uh, dp's account and i think uh, his lse background uh, especially professor popper's view about the social theory of rationality and other sociologists of that time social construction of reality so these things have their impact on professor yeah. dipins uh, uh, version of things because uh, uh, and also uh, he has uh, taken into account since uh, he is trying to give us a relativistic account he has taken the accounts of uh, postmodernist and phenomenologists and uh, in this connection i would try to uh, very briefly i would try to bring three types of relativism one is moral relativism second is truth relativism and the third one is descriptive relativism and this descriptive relativism discusses society and culture 
uh, as I understand DP's version and Professor Sundar Rajan's version, without any uh, critical analysis, just they describe. So, uh, how do you react to this observation? Thank you, sir. Sorry, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor uh, uh, Ranjit Goshi. I'm happy that uh, you could be here. Uh, I always uh, like your wonderful questions. Now, uh, it is true that uh, he has been uh, very much influenced uh, by Popper because this uh, social dimension of man, I would say, has uh, emerged in uh, 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 DP's writings because of uh, uh, his Popperian outlook, I would say. And he was also uh, basically uh, uh, a philosopher who is concerned about uh, 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 human beings as such. Uh, this is one one uh, uh, point which uh, we have to take into account uh, while uh, 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 while uh, reading the philosophy of uh, DP, because he is always concerned about the social dimension of man. Man in a society is for him important, not man as an individual but man uh, as, as part of the society. What role human being or man can play in the context of a, a society is very important. For, um, that um, perhaps makes him one of the uh, uh, beautiful philosophers of this uh, century. And secondly, you know, with regard to this, uh, you made a very beautiful distinction, three types of relativism. And this descriptive relativism, I think, uh, 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 is not uh, uh, acceptable for the main reason that uh, it uh, it does not evaluate. You know? It it simply describes a particular situation, uh, and uh, this cannot help us uh, in understanding the reality. So I would say that is perhaps one of the reasons why, though he has not mentioned about this, uh, uh, use this term. Uh, he has, I mean, DP has always pointed out that the descriptive nature is not uh, something uh, uh, which cannot be accepted at all, all the time. Of course, one can start uh, the conception with this, but it is not uh, uh, the end in itself. This is how I view this uh, problem. But uh, this your uh, way of understanding these three types of relativism is something very significant at this point, I think. And also, I would like to say that uh, many of uh, uh, yeah, you made a reference to postmodernism and phenomenology. Yeah. I think he is aware of, uh, I am trying to locate uh, uh, whether he has uh, 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 elaborately discussed uh, a postmodern understanding. Because uh, here and there I could see some of his, uh, uh, I mean, uh, very, very, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, thin statements regarding postmodern understanding. But uh, I am still searching whether uh, there is something which uh, I have not read in his approach with regard to postmodern. But no doubt, he's a pure and pure uh, phenomenologist, uh, which uh, one can see in all his writing. Because I feel when he made the distinction between, I, I think I said this, when he made this distinction between the object consciousness and the subject consciousness, as I said in my talk, that my mind was trying to connect it with the phenomenological approach where we talk about the first person phenomenology and the third person phenomenology, where you know, uh, 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 Daniel Dennett and others talk about the heterophenomenology. So, this I was so he was trying to transcend uh, the traditional phenomenology, which has been emphasized by Brentano and others. This is how I interpret. I my I, I will not claim that my interpretation is absolutely right, but I feel that there is always a, an hermeneutical understanding which is very much essential to understand a thinker. Because since uh, the thinker is not available with us, uh, we can, uh, we have to interpret that. We, we have to interpret it for the betterment of the society. And this, I think, is uh, one way of understanding uh, um, DP's uh, approach. And also another beautiful thing which I would like to mention here is he's, a, he's a, such a wonderful, I think you, you might have moved with him and many uh, participants here, such a wonderful and uh, down to earth person. This is something which I, I want to mention here. Uh, I'll take just two minutes uh, to narrate this incident because this is very much essential. This was some, uh, perhaps some 20 years ago, 
uh, the uh, JICPR has published a volume on uh, what is that? History of history, uh, sorry, uh, historiography and civilization. Uh, this was a special volume edited by Dayaji, and in which uh, we find the article of uh, Professor DP. That uh, article, I, I if you could uh, read that, I'll be very grateful to you. Uh, in that book, in that article, DP has uh, elaborately discussed uh, the significance of uh, historiography from the Western side and also Indian side. <laughs> and while tracing the <coughs> historiography, he makes a distinction between Aryan historiography and uh, uh, Dravidian historiography. And I felt there is something, uh, uh, something, uh, some error which he has committed, knowingly or unknowingly. So I wrote an extensive uh, reply to this uh, article, uh, and Daya uh, said that he would publish my article, I mean my my review of that article, along with the DP. So DP, see, after all, uh, I I am I am I am a very ordinary person. DP is a, such a big person. He's a well-known uh, philosopher throughout the country and outside. But he took time to write a rejoinder to my um, uh, article, uh, to my rejoinder, and then both were published in uh, JICPR. Why I'm quoting this is, he could have simply ignored my my review of his article because you know, he's such a busy person. Not only that, he's a very big person. But he took time and uh, replied this thing which was published. And not only that, later when I met him in one ICPR seminar in New Delhi, in New Delhi he quoted me saying that I made a mistake and then uh, uh, Parisulam has corrected this. This is what he openly declared in the meeting. See, such a great person uh, is uh, DP. So, I mean, he's a remarkable person. I mean, this is uh, another aspect, uh, a person, such a, such a very big uh, person, but at the same time, down to earth person, very humble and very, uh, very ordinary person, I would say. In his approach uh, towards others, this is this is this I really appreciate. Thank you, thank you, thank sir. You, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Panishilman. Just I want to say one thing that I referred uh, Popperian analysis of truth by convention and truth by nature, and yeah. uh, the, and uh, this thing is re uh, reflected in. Uh, yeah. It is writing truth by convention. That is truth by convention. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Truth by convention. You are right, yeah. sir. Absolutely right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ghosh and Professor Panu Selvam for uh, this. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah. in the chat box, we have uh, um, three questions by Pranay. Um, they well, they are partially answered. I feel, but still, um, uh, Doctor Dev, if you want to um, uh, directly interact with Professor Panu Selvam, you are uh, free uh, to unmute and uh, raise your questions. Otherwise, we'll. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank. yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask these questions personally. So it's been uh, very much uh, in, encouraging, inspirational to listen to all the same teachers like Pani Selbam, Sir, Ranjit Ghosh, DK Mohanto. Uh, we consider these are the blessings on us, sir. So we would love to listen all of you more time again and again, sir. Thank you. My uh, actually, I I must confess that I am not very much aware of DP's uh, philosophy. But from your lecture, you have presented and discussed all the points in so lucid way. Now I can say I got some uh, uh, writings or the thought process of DP. But the point uh, I would like to uh, mention here that. Uh, Though you have mentioned in your uh, last part of your discussion that there is a uh, possibility or means importance of human experience also, but uh, how far this human experience has been uh, means uh, uh, means uh, uh, instrumental to the development of anthropo anthropological rationalism of DP Chattopadhyay, and the other thing if in one aspect of dp's discussion man is finite and originated in nature uh, product of a nature then how man's rationality is only anthropo anthropological is there any place of uh, supreme rationality or how would you like to discuss these points oh, please thank you sir okay <clears throat> thank you um, 
Dr. Pranay Raddev. Uh, very interesting question. I would like to say <coughs> that in anthropological rationalism of DP, what is uh, in the center is the human experience. It is, uh, one cannot think of uh, uh, the anthropological rationalism because it is, first of all, human centered. When it is human centered, it means that human experience counts. Ultimately, it is a uh, human experience by which we can understand the rationality of a human being. And secondly, uh, there is nothing called the supreme rationality. This is what uh, I would like to say here. Rationality is rationality, wherein the real world is anthropocentric in nature. So, in a real world, you and me participate. So we are the participants of the world. So which means we are guided by the rational principles, which uh, would help us to understand the world in a better way. So why? Because there is no uh, a priori or <coughs> there is no a priori or infallible uh, concept which can be attached to reason, which means it is something uh, anthropocentric in nature. It is always reason is always human nature. This means the uh, human experience alone counts. Apart from that, I would say that there is nothing called uh, supreme rationality. Then why? Because uh, here I would like to say Habermas, who talks about uh, the communicative rationality. Of course, rationality <coughs> uh, can be, <coughs> sorry, one minute. Say it. Rationality can be approached in various ways. When Habermas talks about rationality, he talks about uh, the communicative rationality. That is, he, through communication, one can understand rationality. Because expertly in his uh, well-known book, uh, books, I would say, that uh, theory of uh, uh, communicative action, volume one and two, he talks about, he is developing this communicative rationality. Now, here we, we have the anthropological rationality wherein the human uh, being is the center. Human being is the one who is closely associated with reason. Otherwise, uh, reason or rationality has no place. That is the reason why he is trying to develop anthropological rationality. Sir. rationality. So, this means there is, apart from this uh, anthropological rationality, there is nothing called supreme rationality. Supreme rationality has no place uh, in the writings of uh, uh, DP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, well, well, in this connection, what I could get from Dr. Pranay uh, is that, uh, as you said, that man is first born in nature, then connected to society. So that's the point he wants to raise that uh, it's how it is only anthropological. Would, would there be anything more that can be added to the rationality part apart from being anthropological? So this is maybe the question that uh, Dr. Pranay has in mind. Thank you. Well, sir. Then we have with us uh, Dr. Anurima Bhattacharya. Man, well, well, welcome, madam. Professor uh, Anurima. Well, she has raised her hand. Well, welcome, madam. Are you there, Anurima, madam? Uh, yes, yes, welcome, madam. Madam, are you speaking? You are not audible. Hello. Yes, you are not audible, madam. Yes, is he is he audible? Well, I am not able to hear her. Is he audible? No, no. I am mute. No, 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 no. She is not audible. She, she is not, not audible. audible. Okay. So in the meantime, well, um, uh, before um, uh, um, let us. Let us go for any other um, um, uh, participant here who wants to raise questions. Well, they are welcome. Well, we have Will Pramuth Madha, sir, um, unmuting himself. Well, sir, Pramuth, sir, please. Your views and your observations, questions. Professor Das. Yes, <laughs> because it is very comprehensive and very clear. Professor D.P. Jatavadhyaya 
in this lecture of uh, uh, Professor uh, Pandey Salvanji, it is redefining two concepts. One is man, and the other is religion. Man is defined with reference to the society, and religion is defined with reference to uh, anthropological perspective. I think the entire lecture has been centered around this conception. So when we are talking, when we are relating man with society, we take into account economics, human evolution, human behavior, human language, the relation between man and world, the relation between man and society, and how man is the center of everything. And when we are discussing about region, we are not so much theoretical, we are not so much logical, we are not so much traditional, we are relating region with um, religion as uh, even um, uh, not uh, practical religion like Immanuel Kant, here we are taking religion as human experience. And, and uh, why, do, why do we do that? Or why do, why does uh, D.P. Jatabadha um, give importance to this? Because we are living in the empirical world, having empirical experience, having empirical problems, and we are living in a such a society as Ambedkar spoke about uh, just society, Mahatma Gandhi spoke about ideal society. So here, Dipi Chattopadhyaya is giving importance on a society which should be, which should be regulated by anthropological regime. And that, that is how we can, we can think of a complete personality of a man. This is my submission. With a folded hand, I congratulate Professor Pandi Sabhanji. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dasji. <coughs> uh, always uh, you try to connect uh, a concept with uh, Indian tradition. That is something remarkable, uh, which I always uh, cherish and enjoy. Now, uh, one one uh, beautiful point which uh, you have uh, 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 emphasized here is how reason is a part of a, a human experience. In fact, this is what this is the entire uh, lecture of mine can be reduced to by, I mean, can be just, you know, uh, reduced into this full sentence that reason is something which is uh, derived from human experience. That's all. That's what you are saying. And also, you have very uh, rightly pointed out that human experience operates uh, mm. at the empirical level. Yes. This, this, this is the yes. crux of my talk, and you have yes. very beautifully pointed out. I am very grateful to you for emphasizing this. And you have brought out in a very, very beautiful way. It's, it's a subtle way of saying uh, uh, this, this uh, the anthropological thing. And also, man, is, and also man. And also the young. So this has who, got who uh, a man, very good... Who is a man? And yeah, he, yeah. he has defined man in a very yeah, beautiful yeah. way. Very we, should, we should know our identity. We should know our yeah, identity. identity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very, 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 thank very, you, very, thank you, very, thank you, sir. very. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Oh, uh, Professor uh, Panisilvanji, oh, uh, when uh, would you explain it uh, a bit more? That when DP says that economic man is not a rational man, can it be sustainable? Is it is it, is it just uh, uh, challenging the Martian version, or uh, what type of uh, assertion that he is making? <laughs> In a quandary as to what he wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, no problem. <coughs> See, uh, just uh, the, sir, one thing, one thing, sir. Well, what uh, uh, Professor Ghosh has said, well, the same thing uh, comes to my mind. He says, economic man is not rational. 
and at the same time he wants to bring in morality in economics so the question is is it being rational is same as saying being moral so this is uh, one thing that we need to see in dp because he says he wants to bring in morality in economics and at the same time we see that economic man is not rational so is it is it is it, is it right to assert that being rational is to be uh, moral well i may be wrong but yeah. is it possible is, is uh, it yeah let me let me uh, go back to this uh, very interesting concept <coughs> when uh, dp talks about uh, the rationality all of us know that he is talking about rationality or i mean the, the 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 human knowledge in the context of economics evolutionary biology and psychological behaviorism now the first one we are now concentrating uh, we are examining rather that is uh, rational economic man now who is a, a rational economic man uh, dp very clearly says that he is not concerned about the economic man but uh, rational economic man who is this rational economic man uh, the rational economic man is not one uh, uh, one who is in management that uh, the management head uh, Uh, according to him is not only rational has to be not only rational but also uh, uh, moral which means he is talking about uh, the rational as well as a uh, moral uh, human being uh, in in fact uh, i would i would go further and say that uh, love and gratitude sympathy and uh, the concern for others are very much essential for human being and he would uh, uh, go to the extent of saying that these are unfortunately absent in rational economic man because he is always in search of uh, 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 the economic prosperity which means the social uh, welfare is very much necessary for sustaining the rationality otherwise we fall into irrationality so this means uh, the methodology which uh, dp has uh, accepted by saying rem uh, he would say that economic man of course is very much uh, uh, yes we appreciate it but uh, he lacks the moral uh, uh, aspects most of the time so now for example i would like to connect it with uh, 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 the sustainability for example the sustainability wherein we argue that uh, the uh, the the management or the government let us say or the it companies they should follow certain guidelines which can really help uh, the human society that is their profit uh, should not be uh, only uh, centered on uh, uh, profit making so this aspect i would say uh, is something very important in the context of dp because he is talking about the economic man who has to be moral and unfortunately he says most of the time at least uh, that the economic man the economic rationality fails to appreciate the moral values perhaps that uh, is what he is uh, trying to emphasize by his uh, writings that's what uh, i would uh, say Thank and you, that sir. means uh, if he uh, takes it economic man is not a rational man as a paradigm then uh, he also allows the paradigm shift in the line of copper because yeah 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 definitely yeah yeah one context yeah. the if this holds good in another yeah. context it may not hold good that is the thing yeah. okay okay that will do thank you sir thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so much well anurama madam has joined well um, well are you ready madam well she is there well thank you please ma'am madam carry on madam madam please you are not audible you are not audible madam not audible well let us wait for her a minute but in the meantime if somebody wants to raise any question well they are welcome uh, it is 835 well we can have uh, for um, this session for another day. may I, well prana yes may i be allowed to yeah, yes, yes yes thank yes. you in, in the in the meantime yes 
Yeah, sir. Sir, as a anthropological rationalism and uh, existentialism. So I find there are many similarities. So what is the main uh, point of difference? So this is the main point I would like to ask, sir. See, uh, existentialism and anthropology with regard to the fallibility of a man. That is, uh, uh, when he talks about the fallibility of man, BP is very uh, clear uh, in saying that human beings are uh, always, or sometimes, let us say, sometimes they can make mistakes and they can rectify their mistakes, which means there is a possibility for human beings to correct or recorrect himself or um, uh, her, herself. So in this way, one can say that there is a methodology which can really help us to know the real nature of uh, human beings. And secondly, in uh, uh, DP's methodology, synthesis and analysis is very much essential because, as, as I said, that this methodology is uh, very, very uh, essential because uh, it is by this dialectical process one can understand the true nature of human being. So the existential dialectic which you are talking about is already included in this approach uh, of uh, anthropological rationalism. So anthropological rationalism, first of all, is not something which is uh, devoid of human beings. It talks about the partic as I said just now, the participatory human being, wherein you can always argue that uh, the role of human being is very important. So this is what I would like to with regard to your uh, questions, because all questions which are raised is uh, of course are closely interrelated. So I think uh, uh, when DP talks about uh, the world, he talks about uh, the real world, the real world which is uh, uh, anthropocentric in nature. So the identity, uh, the true identity of the world is always disclosed and it is in man that this identity is really, uh, realized. So reality asset is uh, realized or it is something which has to be lived. So here we can see the existential nature of human being. So in this way, DP would uh, answer uh, some of the questions which you have raised because you no know, DP is of the view that there is always uh, a, a dialogue that is a critical dialogue that is taking place between one man and the other, one philosopher and the other. So this goes on, the process goes on. And as a result of that, you can see the synthesis of a uh, 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 you can see the interrelation that exists between synthesis and analysis. This is what I would like to say, Anurima, with regard to your questions. Hello. One one sentence I want to add to this that uh, yeah. uh, he suggests for uh, no, uh, when he is talking about this manless world, probably he is suggesting that it is not man in isolation but man yeah. in interaction. Correct, correct, correct. Because others are more important than myself. Uh, well, the, in the discourse, uh, discourse of myself right. and others, you are right. You are, more you are absolutely than... right. Well, you are absolutely the manless yes. world. It means the existence of the other. That's why I connected uh, uh, DP with uh, Levinas, who yeah. talks about the other. The other is important. So I cannot live in isolation, as uh, I discussed, and you also said that uh, anthropological solipsism has no uh, meaning in his talk. So the other must exist. Because when we, take about, when we talk about human experience, that human experience involves the existence of uh, the, other, the other. Otherwise, no, it, it leads to solipsism. This is what we would uh, like to reject. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Well, uh, well, one thing, um, just one line. There's the, so um, what we get is that the real world that uh, Professor D.P. talks of is the anthropological world wherein uh, man lives and he keeps on evolving and evolving and there is no end to it because he says man is only in the process and there is man is not the product. So there is evolution is going on, going on and the changes are brought in, in the society. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank well, you. over to thank Professor. You. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, the, the beautiful responses that you had. Well, over, over to Professor uh, Kailas Mahana, sir, for uh, proposing a formal vote of thanks. Over to you. Sir. Uh, one sentence, one sentence. Yes, 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 yes. Can, yes sir. 
Pleasure. Um, when we are t- t- speaking of others, when others think of others, when other, others think of others, so ultimately it is the individual who is the center. Because I am thinking of the other, the other is also thinking of me as the other. So ultimately, it is anthropocentric, it is anthropological, it is the it individual is. who is existential, who has, who has his own existence and he is thinking of the other and the other is also thinking of the other. So, correct, correct. Thank you, thank you. Babu, in, in this connection, I would uh, like to just uh, bring one proverb. Everybody is somebody to somebody in order to be anybody. Yes. <laughs> that is the thing. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, sir. Double minus, um, in mathematics, double minus <laughs> is, 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 is a positive sign. Thank you, yeah. thank you, sir. Over to Koyla, sir. Over to Koyla, sir. For both of thanks. Okay. So, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Gao and Professor Das. So, today's deliberation made by Professor Ponit Selvam, sir, and the observations made by our learned professors have glorified the virtual academic program of philosophy family. So we extend our gratitude to all of them. Today, the presence of the glorious presence of Professor Dilip Mahmanta, Professor Amit Balmiki, Professor Andrima, Professor Anjit Gose, and uh, Rajat Bhattachar sir, and others have also glorified the academic journey of philosophy family. They have supported us, they have cooperated us, and they have given us academic, academic strength to continue our journey. So today, one thing that I most appreciate the words of Professor Dilip Kumar Mahanda, who said that today, the talk presented by Professor Ponir Selvastar is an excellent, is excellent, and he said that uh, Professor Ponir Selvastar is an academic, is an excellent academic cook. So today, we all have enjoyed the uh, deliberation, the excellent uh, uh, presentation by Professor Pandir Selvam sir. And today, Professor Amita Varmiki has initiated the observation and query. And Professor Pandir Selvam sir has also very excellently re- responded to her. And with Professor Amit, Amit Valmiki, Professor Dilip Kumar Mahanta sir, Professor Anjit Ghosh sir, Professor Pramod Das, Professor Dr. K. Omnanarao, Pranam Dev, and, and Andrew Madam in chat box also, they all have put their observation queries on the anthropological rationalism, which is a key concept of Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay. So all the observations have glorified our thought and enriched our academic thrust on the philosophy of Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay. So today, I don't want, want to speak more. I, uh, I, I propose my heartful gratitude to all the learned professors, those who have put their observation and queries on Professor D.P. Chattopadhyay's philosophy. So today, the way that Professor Panir Selvam sir has tried to justify deep stand on the observation made by all the senior professors has also enriched our way of questioning and way of responding to the answers. Thanks so much to all the participants, those who remain now, to witness such a glorious program in philosophy family. I also put my thanks to Professor Pramod Madas for inviting such a stalwart in, in that is a philosophy, Professor 
Pandit Selvan sir to philosophy family. So his his presence and his reflective thought has enriched our philosophical reflection. I also like to thank Dr. K. Omnan Rao. The way he moderated and the way he presented his reflective thought. So it also uh, it also encouraged us in our future programs. So with this, once again, I extend my gratitude to the uh, speakers, sir, Professor Pandit Shalabhisham sir, to the co-sign regis and to all the participants of today's webinar. So thanks so much again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, we, shall, also, Professor uh, we shall request um, Professor to select another topic. So we, yes, shall, sir. we shall create a, a slot for you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With this meeting, thank you. 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 Thank you.